pollinators, honeybees, and native plants. And, and what is really unique about Brian O'Neill, he's a conservationist, an outdoors person, and he really sees the, the big picture. And that's truly important when you're, uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with herbicide applications and, and natural areas. So with that, uh, Brian O'Neill, I'd like to introduce you and let you take over. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure uh, being here tonight. And Brian, let's get into the slides. And um, as we said, we're gonna hold all the questions until the end, but if you have some questions, you can you know, forward them. Now, Brian, if they wanna download any of this in the future, because there's a lot of information we're gonna be going through, would they be able to do that? If you're willing to share it, I can email it as a PDF to everybody after tonight. Absolutely. Okay with that, Brian. absolutely. This is, yeah, this is absolutely the best way to uh, get information out to everyone. Okay. Well, then if it's okay with you, I can also record it. Whatever's easier is for you. It is recording. So uh, before I switch over to your slides, I just want to say thanks to the uh, E. Neal Docstator Foundation. We received a grant for uh, Brian O'Neill to help us put together a management program here at the Myrick Conservation Center. He'll get into that a little bit. And then this presentation is funded as part of the Doc Stater Foundation grant. So we do thank them for that. And then Brian, uh, can you see the poll there of who's participating? Yes. So uh, you get an idea. Uh, we have uh, uh, a number of homeowners, people with properties in one to 10 acres, a few over 10 to 100. And it seems like people are interested in uh, different topics, especially damage to trees on their property. So here we go. I'm going to share now your presentation. Okay, next slide. That's me. Let me, let me set this up as a slideshow here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so these little buggers came in. They were discovered in Berks County in September uh, of 14. Um, they estimate they really truly arrived in 12. They're native to parts of Asia and they've been, re re they've been introduced to South Korea and they're not real happy about them either. Next slide, please. So this is the adult, about one inch, very beautiful. Um, this is a, for this area, you'll see this guy July, August, September into October. In fact, I had some into November last year because we had a late frost. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the life cycle. Very top at 12 o'clock are the eggs and the eggs are now starting to hatch. Um, as they, as the, as the first little guys come out, which is May to June. Now I got a report yesterday that they're now showing up along I-95 near the airport, Philadelphia airport. Um, and I have not seen any myself. And I, I was in uh, Newark last week. I was in North Jersey. I was in central New Jersey. I was in Chester County today. And I looked around and I did not see any of the first uh, instars yet. Second instars are much bigger near June to July and they start to show some color. Then going into June and these guys are the ones that are crawling around, jumping up and down. And they're the ones that are gonna attack your roses and they're gonna attack your vegetables and your ornamentals. By the end of July, they really start to show that fourth instar with the true colors. And then the adults start to show up and they will run in this general area pretty much I've seen the full-winged adults um, August, September, October, and into November of last year. And then going into November and even early December, they will start mating and laying their eggs. And of course, their egg masses will show you um, where they show, you know, where they hatch their eggs. Um, and it's a one generation per year in Pennsylvania. So the whole life cycle is one 365 days plus or minus. Next slide, please. There's the little guy, pretty cute little bug, but he can 
But if you're a uh, guy growing grapes or row crops um, or ornamental trees, you're really scared of these guys because that's where the real damage is going to be. Next slide, please. Next slide, Brian. There he is. Now you show some color. This is now going into the third instar. Very, very cute bug. But thank goodness they don't bite. They just, they just eat the wrong things. We can teach them to eat some invasive weeds, you know, like mile a minute. It'd be nice, but they don't. Next slide, please. Now we get into the adult stage. And they aren't really true flyers. They more glide than anything else. Uh, and they are, as I said, they are very beautiful, but as you will see, um, with the grant that we received and uh, some other projects we did last year, we put a very small dent in them. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is as of March 12th, 2021 from the Integrated uh, Pest Management. The blue shows where the spotter lanternfly is presently active. Now you got to remember that in that little red area up there at Burke County, just north of Chester County, that's where they all started and that was in 12 or 2012-2014. They're now up into Connecticut. They are in Long Island. Uh, they're down three quarters of the way in Delaware uh, and they're all the way across Pennsylvania. And how do they get there? Well they hitchhike and we'll go into that in another slide. But the original quarantine area, and it's been expanded, as you can see the red line, and federal government hoped we could stop them, and they couldn't. Next slide, please. Here's the problem. The spotter Atlanta 5 feeds on more than 70 trees, from grapes, apples, peaches, black walnuts, hops, the hops that you make your beer out of, vegetables, blueberries, Staghorn sumac, sycamores, maples. Next slide. And there's a whole list of adults that right now, of course, the tree of heaven is their real host, but I've seen them on willows, sycamores, sassafras, roses. Um, the interesting part is I don't see them on knockouts as often as I see them on other roses. I don't see them as often on multiflora rose as I see them on or the ornamental climbing roses. So they must have a, a certain uh, taste bud and who knows, but they are d damaging all of these trees and ornamentals. Next slide, please. Well, here's their host and the tree of heaven. And the way to identify the easiest way of tree out of heaven is when it's in a leaf like this, take the leaves, scrunch them in your hand and smell the leaves. It smells like burnt peanut butter. And if you have this tree, you need to control it because they are going to come after this tree. This is their host. Okay, next slide, please. As you can see, the leaves are opposite. Okay, and of course there's a male and female tree and we'll get that into that in a little bit. Um, there's the bark and there's the flower. And the key to this is if you have this on your property, you want to control this tree. You want to get rid of it. And you do not want to cut it down because if your tree guy says, I can cut this down and it won't grow again, he's feeding you a bunch of bull because this is a root suckering species and as Jim Jordan said, if you cut this down, you're not going to have 15 trees. You're going to have 500 trees because wherever those roots are, they're going to shoot suckers. And then you're going to have them all over the place. Last year, I had a land, a very famous landscape architect in the main line in Lower Marion had a tree removed. They treated the tree. They used the wrong material. And she probably had 5,000 little stems come up in her gardens, came up in her neighbor's yard, came up in her neighbor's pool, uh, patio, and they came because of the root systems. So you need to control this tree. Next slide, please. There they are ready to mate. We won't go into how they mate, but 
we'll leave that to uh, someone else. Next slide, please. Okay, here they are. Now this was taken and that's every single one of them. And that is on a Lantus tree. And they're all trying to, they're basically puncturing into that bark and taking the sap. They excrete a material called honeydew and it turns black. You can look at the leaves on the right side and the left side and you can see the honeydew. You don't wanna park your car underneath these guys because it will really cut into your wax paint and it's very sticky, sticky, sticky. Um, I, I know of customers who had them on their backyards. They didn't want to get rid of the trees. And before the end of the summer, we had to get rid of the trees because they couldn't, their kids' toys were completely black from the honeydew and their backyard, they couldn't, the kids couldn't play. Next slide, please. Okay. You can see what they can do. When they find a tree that they like, they're coming after it. And you can see the sticky paper right here and they will climb over top of each other to get to the top of that tree to get into the young stems up in the tree so they can suck on that tree. They'll climb right over each other. Okay, next slide please. Okay, tree banding. Very good management tool for catching these things. Head scraping is the most important thing. We're kind of running out of that window right now. And you'll see some slides later on of where they hatch their eggs and you'll be very surprised. You can see that tree band that's on the outside of a, I can't tell what tree it is from here, but either way, and I'll show you pictures that I had so many of them climbing a pin oak this summer that I had to change mine every week because they were getting covered. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's the key. During January, February, these guys aren't sitting around thinking about what they're gonna eat come March, April, May, and so on and so forth. Anytime you can scrape the eggs, and we'll show you how to do that, it's very helpful. When you wanna start putting up your sticky bands and or wildlife barriers, and that's very key because the sticky bands can catch um, problem, it can be, it can have collateral damage. I'm going to show you some pictures of some birds that got caught in some of the bands, not the ones that we put together. These were sent to me by uh, Penn State or Cornell or Rutgers, okay? When the crawlers are out there, you can use a contact insecticide. Contact insecticide means you sp spray it and you kill the bug. A systemic application and there are a couple of different products. They're both named right there. They are injected into the tree or sprayed on the bark and they translocate throughout the tree. And when those little guys start sucking on that tree, they die. And I'm gonna show you some pretty impressive pictures of uh, how we baited, and that's what it's called, baiting these trees, okay? So when they start, they get past our bands, they start sucking on them, they get zapped. Next slide, please. Okay, here is the product that I recommend from the homeowner. You can buy this online. It's Pathfinder 2. It is very, very effective. It is sprayed on the basal bark of the tree. Okay, you wanna use this product anytime from now until mm, probably December. Um, it translocates through the whole tree and kills the whole Atlantis tree. Very, very effective. It is slow. It has a smell to it because it's a Biloxi ester solution of triclopyr, which is also really good on poison ivy. But it's an ester solution, so you're going to know that you sprayed it. Um, this product has a blue dye in it, so you can see exactly where you're spraying. Very important if you're going to, and you buy this product, if you have Atlantis trees, use this, and it doesn't matter what size it is. The difference is if it's a smaller tree, you only have to spray the bark up about 10 to 12 inches. If it's a bigger diameter tree, you better go up to 18 to 19 to 20 inches, depending on its circumference. Next slide, please. So this is an application being done. 
This is one of our crews. And we two weeks ago, we did uh, 2,000 trees for a preserve in Chester County, a natural lands trust uh, facility. Um, so you can see this gentleman is spraying it. Now this is a Birchmeyer sprayer. It's about $350 sprayer. But the nice part about this sprayer is if you do a whole lot of this, the shut off is at the tip of the wand, not where the hand is at the tip. So you're saving a whole lot of chemical because if you've ever used a backpack and you pump it and you spray it, you always have that material that's in the tube between the shut off valve and the tip that's going where the spray is. This one, the shut off right there at the tip. So you save an awful lot of money. Um, Pathfinder 2 is not that expensive, um, but you need to get complete coverage all around the bark of the tree. This is approximately up 19 inches and you can see the blue dye. Okay, next slide, please. You can see it there. This is two weeks after the application and you also want to do the crown and any roots that are showing. Sometimes it's helpful to kick the way of the leaves, of course, because you don't want any breaks because if you leave one half inch where that tree can still translocate up and down into the tree, it will not kill the tree completely. So you need to get complete coverage. And even if you have a root system that's four foot away, spray that root, okay? The material itself is a systemic material that gets into the tree. It doesn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, um, uh, um, half-life, meaning it, it doesn't stay around a whole long time. But if you've got grass or moss or vegetation where you're spraying it, you will turn it brown. It will come back, but the, the key to it is get complete coverage and spray to wet short of runoff. Anything that runs off is not gonna do you any good into waste, but get complete coverage. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we did these, we marked them. And then of course you can see this was done when there was still some snow on the ground, so we could come back to make sure that we got every single tree, we didn't miss any. So it's important. Now, in this situation, we were going through and it wasn't, there was a spot here, a tree here, a tree here, but as you did it and you came, and you came back to make sure and checked them a month or two months later, X marks the spot and you know you treated it. Now remember that Atlantis is a softwood tree. So it's gonna, when it dies, and it'll die within a year, the bigger the tree, it'll take a full year. But it's very important you do not cut it down until it is completely dead. So what we recommend is if you are killing a tree right now, you can cut it down next March. Now, it's not gonna be a major hazard tree because the whole tree doesn't usually fall when it dies. It's a softwood tree, so the limbs kind of fall off and all the rest of it. So keep that in mind. But if you have one really close to a house, uh, it's a whole different situation. Or you know, near a garage or something like that. Next slide, please. Okay, you can see all the X's through the woods. This way we got the little ones, the big ones, and whatever else. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now, for people who are in the organic business, I highly respect your uh, choice of uh, use of non-use of pesticides, um, organic or, what, or whatever. This material you can buy online. It's a certified organic. It's a contact material. I'm not even sure what's in it. Most likely it is, um, um, it's got vinegar and probably orange juice peels in it. This is what you want to use to spot spray any of the um, stages of the lanternfly. If you spray that bug, this material will kill it. Now this is organic. Any general use herbicide from seven to all the other products will kill the lanternflies. But if you wanna use a, a, an organic product, I know this stops, I know this final stop does work and you can buy it. I think they're like $12 for the uh, 24 ounce bottle. And you just need to cover it when you spray it, get the bug. Now, this also is safe in your garden. 
Do not spray your fruit and take it and pick it the next day unless you wash it. But if you see these little guys running around, spot spray them and or when they're adults, spot spray it and you'll kill them with this. Okay, next slide. Okay, well, let's talk about tree bands. This is the Cadillac of all tree bands. This is a plastic uh, tree band. It's the, the, and it's surrounded by foam at the top. So this way the little guys and or the adults can crawl underneath. They can't get past the foam. And on the inside of this plastic is sticky. Now, the problem with this is if you've got a lot of trees to take care of, this can get expensive because that right there is about $30. Um, you cut it to fit the tree, it's very effective. And you can buy this online too. Next slide. Okay, standard sticky papers. You can see that this is the first and second instars crawling up. We've got a dragonfly also. We've got uh, some flies and whatever the case is. And these guys, they're not stupid bugs. They will walk up and they will put their feet out to test it. And they'll try walking around and walking around to find a way to get past this stuff. Um, but they, when they get on it, they're not getting off. The problem with this is it also can catch uh, pollinators. So we've got to be careful. Next slide, please. I like this. You can buy this online. It's about $14 a roll, and it's very, very effective. Now, the trick with this sticky paper is, and I'll show you, is I reverse it. This way, I eliminate the chance of any small birds, any bees, any um, uh, pollinators pretty much getting caught on this because the sticky paper is on the tree side. And I'll show you how this works. Next slide. You go to Home Depot or Lowe's or your local True Value and you buy foam. This is air conditioning foam. The thicker, the better. And I think this roll is about $3. And it depends on what, how long it is. I think this is like uh, 10 feet long. And next slide, please. And so I run this around instead of the foam. And this is on an oak tree. There's a pin oak in my backyard. And that is my small little wildflower meadow right next to it, behind it. And I tack this on and I staple it on, knowing I'm gonna take it off at the uh, end of the year. After this is up, I then do this. Next slide, please. I put the paper down with the sticky part against the tree, but it's got the foams running inside underneath. So these guys can crawl underneath it. I can also, if you take a look um, at five o'clock, you can see a stick sticking out. And I stick a stick up in there. This way there's a gap between the paper and the tree. So this way these guys crawl underneath and they get stuck and they get stuck. Adults, first stage, second stage, very, very effective. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I want to do when I did this originally, I wanted to test this and see how many could get by. So I put down regular sticky paper up on top and I think I caught every gnat and every fly um, in Haverford Township where I live. Next slide, please. So as you can see, these guys are crawling underneath and there's a gap so they can slide underneath. Um, and it, it's, the next slides will show how effective it is. There's a stick sticking out. And they, so they can climb underneath it. And it's very important to make sure there's that gap. Next slide, please. Okay. This is what you end up with. You pull that off and you've got every adult, young guy and whatever else. Now I did this last year. Next slide, please. These are two weeks apart. This is how many we were catching. Now, what I did was, you can see the little pieces of foam. I would pull them off and I'd reuse them. So the air conditioning uh, foam 
gets used all season long. In fact, I saved a whole bunch of it and because I already put mine up to see if I could catch any of the first instars first, and I have not seen any. Next slide. Now we're getting into August, I think, and you can see the adults are really on top of this thing, and they don't get past it. They do not get past it. Next one. Next one. And these are all weeks apart, 10 days to two weeks apart. We're putting a dent in them, but they kept coming and coming. And I had this up until uh, the 1st of December. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, this is, go back there, Brian. Okay, so this tree was baited, which means we in, in injected this tree uh, with an insecticide, a systemic insecticide, but we wanted to see what was gonna happen once the bugs got on. The middle tape, it's approximately two feet off the ground. You can see the adults climbing on top of each other, trying to get by. Now you gotta remember that these guys jump and glide. So we put an extra one up there to see if we got any above that. But on the ground, we laid these tapes, the sticky paper down, and these are the guys crawling to get to the tree. So it's pretty effective. Next slide, please. Now, if you want to use the sticky paper and you want to reverse it, you've got to protect the pollinators and the birds. So you, a lot of people will put these screens over top of it. So these, when they climb the tree, the lantern flies go underneath the netting. This happens to be regular screening. You can buy it, Home Depot or True Value. But the birds, um, if they get stuck, they're not stuck severely and they can pull themselves off of it. Next slide, please. Some people have used chicken wire. It's very effective. Problem is when you want to change the paper, you got to pull the chicken wire off and everything else. This is the same paper I'm using, but they have the sticky paper out. Okay, next slide. This guy got really serious as far as his um, his um, his cage around this. This is one of my employees did this, and he was a young gentleman, and he caught a baby squirrel, and he put on heavy gloves to get the squirrel off, and the squirrel jumped back and bit him in the wrist. So we had to get uh, baby shots. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you get a squirrel, you better be careful because they don't like it. Next slide, please. Now, this is what happens if you've got sticky paper and a young bird gets on it. And that's why it's very important. You've got to protect this situation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is a trap set up down in Ardentown, very effective. You can see the screening. This is a commercial trap. You can buy it. Company in Minnesota sells them. And the bugs crawl up the tree, climb in the, underneath the net. They can't get past the netting because the whole netting's around the tree, the screening, and they climb in and they go into that bag. And it's a very effective. That is probably... 15 to 16 dollar maybe a little bit more than that this year 22 dollar gizmo but it's very effective and you don't have to change it as often you just got to pull the plastic bag off when it gets full and change it next next slide please Bear with me, Brian. It's uh, frozen here for a sec. It's okay. There we go. Is that the next one? That's yeah. the next one. This is the same situation, and you can see 
all the first and second instars are in that catch bag up on top. And what they did on this was you can see it's just the, the push tacks hold it together. And if you go online, you can build these yourself. I mean, if you, you know, you know, if you, your husband or your wife's a, a handy person, they're very easy to build. The big difference is you've got to design them for the size of the tree. So if it's a big tree, you've got a whole lot of screening to do. Okay, next slide, please. Bear with me again. It's okay, I think you've got some first instars inside your computer trying to stop us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so instead of the plastic bag, this is a perforated bag. Um, it's, we came up with this instead because you can buy 500 of these little bags for about $10 where people put uh, favors in for weddings or bar mitzvahs or whatever else, um, and they work great. And the guys can't get out of it. They come in, they keep climbing and climbing and climbing. They are very effective for the first, second, and third. The adults, it, 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 it's a hit or miss because many, many times these guys will get to the, to the, to the bottom of the trap and they will jump and try to get over top of it. The little guys can't do that. Okay. Now, this is a baited tree. Now, the, the, tree, the, the most important thing is this tree was treated with a systemic pesticide, okay? But do not treat flowering trees of the females. You want to kill the female trees because you've got to remember that the systemic insecticide translocates all the way through that tree and if bees and pollinators go to feed on that tree, you're going to lose some pollinators. So the key to it is you kill all the female trees as they produce the seeds and then you bait with the systemic insecticide male trees. So when we come to a property, if they've got 30 or 40 trees, let's say they've got 30 trees, we will kill all of them except for three and then bait three. So all these lanternflies, whatever stage they are, they go to that tree, they start sucking on that sap and they drop dead. It takes them about 10 minutes after they start sucking on that tree to kill them. Now there's been research done by Cornell and Penn State that if a dog eats these lanternflies or a cat eats these lanternflies, or some another animal eats these lanternflies, there's, there's, there's no chain reaction as far as the systemic insecticide hurting the um, animal that's eating the uh, lanternflies because the dose metabolizes very quickly in this bug. But when you've got some big trees and you can see it's a good picture of uh, the trees surrounded by Japanese still grass. That'll be another presentation. But yeah, so these guys get on that tree and they, it doesn't matter if they jump 10 feet up the tree and start climbing up and start sucking on that sap, they're dead. And this was a baited tree, September, 2020. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is an orchard. And in, a, in an orchard, you cannot use systemic insecticides because you don't want any residual in the grapevines themselves. So this farmer sprayed his grapevines with a contact material. And you can see the amount of lanternflies that drop after that, that application. And here's the problem. This guy would do this, let's say he did this on a Saturday and then didn't see any more lanternflies and took his family next weekend uh, up to the Poconos 
to go, you know, up to their cabin or rent a cabin or down to the beach and whatever else. And 10 million lanternflies or a million lanternflies flew in with the wind when he wasn't there. As soon as they hit that orchard and they love grapes, they love grape vines. Uh, they love, I've seen them on bittersweet. I've seen them, yes. He will lose his crop for two years. And that's the one of the biggest concerns that we need to keep these guys in check. Next slide, please. There's the egg mass. And this egg mass is found, as we talked about, from September to June. In this area, uh, pretty much they're gonna be hatching pretty soon. This has been a weird year. Soil temperatures haven't reached 60 degrees yet. And when those soil temperatures get to 55 or 60, and we've, and we've had warm weather and then 31 degree days, these guys are gonna start to hatch. And even though we did a big, we did some damage to them last year, every one of these sacks, they were about an inch and a half to two inches long, have about 75 eggs in them, plus or minus. So, and every one of those guys is gonna be a first stage instar come the end of this month. So if you see them, next slide, please, this egg mass, you can see it here on the side of a tree. And if you take off the cover, that's what it looks like on the top, covered and uncovered egg mass. So this one had probably 25 to 30 eggs. Next slide, please. Now, from Penn State, this is where they've taken pictures of where these egg masses are. On a basketball, on an old piece of furniture, a lady's hat, on tires. And this is how they are moving around the country. This is how they got across into Ohio. Okay, they didn't fly there. They laid their eggs on something. And that vehicle drove to Ohio and they hatched. Had a piece of furniture on it, had whatever the case was. So it's very important if you're moving um, a vehicle in the area that's in where we are right now, you check to make sure you don't have any of these egg masses. The egg masses, I said, will, are gonna hatch by the end of May, early June, and they will not start hatching, not start laying eggs again until September. But it's very important, and it, and it goes along with uh, the emerald ash borer too, as far as wood. If you've got wood and you're gonna take it up to your camp, your deer camp, your fishing camp, your weekend camp, whatever else, do not take wood from in this area because you're going to be transporting these guys, especially during the winter months. Next slide, please. Best way to get rid of the eggs is scrape them and destroy the eggs mass. What I like doing is taking an old credit card or even a paint scraper, stick them in a bag, and then stick a little bit of alcohol or, thank you, pandemic, any of the sanitizers in that plastic bag and that destroys the eggs. Don't think, of, don't walk around with your grandkids trying to chop them with a hammer or whatever the case is, because um, you'll damage the tree, but just scrape it into a jar and put a little alcohol in there and you're done. Next slide, please. Uh, let me see, Brian. And that's that not your last be. slide, is it? It could be. Yep, I think it is. So in a quick review, the key to it is look for the Atlantis trees on your property. If you have them, you need to control them. Do not cut them down. You need to control them chemically. Um, the mistake that, I, as I mentioned, the landscape architect and, the, and the, he was a certified arborist, said, oh, I'm going to cut this down and I'm going to paint straight Roundup glyphosate on the stump. And that'll stop it from, uh, that'll translocate. That will work on a whole lot of trees. It does not work on Atlantis. Because if you try to um, cut it down and the systemic material gets cut off by the root systems, 
and it will not translocate throughout the whole root system of the tree. And that's where you need to you need to really, I mean, this is a real root suckling species. Second choice is, is, is to do your uh, bait trees um, by a certified arborist. You can buy the material yourself. You can follow the Penn State, you can go on Penn State's website with the formulation. It's very, very effective um, if you feel like uh, you want to go in that direction. All right, Brian, I have a couple questions if you're ready for that. Yeah. Anybody else, feel free to ask, add your questions in the chat, or um, once we get off, we could uh, have you on mute. First one, uh, this is a good question. Is it true that after two jumps, the bug doesn't have enough energy for more jumps? I guess that's if you chase it. <laughs> um, I've chased them across my driveway uh, the adults and they keep flying, they keep jumping and, you know, now they're looking for mates. So they're, uh, it's the old fraternity uh, scenario. I mean, they're on the hunt. So yeah, they, in cooler weather, later in, in the November, they're not as active. But in August, September, October on warm days, I mean, I've had my grandkids out there try to hit them with the uh, tennis, you know, tennis, old tennis rackets, and they're jumping all over the place because they will jump from a tree into my wildflower area. And as soon as we walk away, they fly from that wildflower area onto my pin oak. The problem with my <laughs> pin oak is it's next to a school grounds. And last year, the school would not let me treat some Atlantis trees. So I was north east of the Atlantis trees and prevailing winds from the southwest pushed most of them towards their first big tree, which happened to be my pin oak. Now this year, next week, I'm going to start uh, uh, targeting the Atlantis trees because the school district gave me permission to get rid of them. But yes, they will, they do jump. The little guys will jump. Um, yes. They'll jump more than uh, a couple feet a couple times. Uh, next question. Is there a certain time of year that is best to apply Pathfinder? Um, Any time except for no, end of November, December, January, and February. Because you don't get the translocation. You want to apply this material. So it goes down into the tree and up into the tree at the same time. So with Pathfinder, anytime except when you're uh, waiting for Santa Claus to show up and open up your Christmas presents. So as a reminder to people, that's the herbicide that kills the tree. Yes, that, that, is, the, that is the herbicide that kills the tree. Where are the best places to look for egg masses? Well, you saw the pictures everywhere. I mean, the sides of houses, um, old farm equipment, um, your lawnmower, if you leave it outside covered, you know, your John Deere mower behind your garage or whatever else, when you pull it off this spring, check for the egg masses. Um, and it doesn't matter. They can be on the sunny side. A lot of times though, the egg masses will be in a under a limb on the bottom side of a limb for protection but they're very easy to spot they're very easy to spot as you can see right here now this is a debark tree but you it, it, they stand out this question okay, is i heard that uh heard that petroleum is something that can be used as a substitute for sticky traps it may mean petroleum jelly i'm guessing well, here's uh, the problem. Prevent bycatch. Um, the problem with petroleum jelly is once it's on a tree, and there and there are commercial products that um, are sticky, but the problem is it takes the solvent to break them down to get them off the tree, and now you got to deal with the solvent, and some of the solvents you got to be very careful of. 
they can damage the bark and penetrate the bark. So I don't recommend uh, petroleum jelly um, at all. This question is, uh, in a large forested property area, how many bait trees are used per acre? Depends on the, the count, as I mentioned before, if you've got 25, if you've got one Atlantis tree and there's no other Atlantis trees in there, use it as a bait tree. If it's one per acre, because they will come to that. There was a homeowners association in Berwyn last year had a, uh, a tree company come in and chop down close to 500 Atlantis trees and they didn't treat them. And I was on site because I had to do some invasive work on some Japanese knotweed and the trees that were cut down, laying on the ground, were just covered mm. with lanternflies. The stumps were just covered with lanternflies. And at that time, young sprouts were coming up from the sucker growth and they were just covered. So, and the problem was the homeowner station already knows they're gonna have 100,000 land, uh, Atlantis trees this year that they're gonna to have to treat because they didn't properly kill the tree before they cut it down. Hmm. So when we did yours, Jim, we, we had a few bait trees and you know, we probably baited, uh, we had a, if we had one Atlantis tree, we maybe killed three close by and left that as a bay tree. And that would cover five or six acres minimum. Yeah, here at the Myrick Center, uh, we um, killed 200 trees and we only did 10 bait trees. And that was largely because there were clusters. So you treated one tree, if there was a cluster of 25 or 50, you left one bait tree in that cluster. Yep. And that was very effective. Yes, the systemic. We will. It, yep, go ahead. The, the systemic material, you don't want to spray it too early because it does break down into the tree. So if you go back to the slide of when, and there's two products um, right there, the bottom two lines show. The, the, the two products, the first one's Mary, the second one is Safari, which are the trade names, and the most effective time. The reason why the um, imidacord, which is the Merit, it is slower to uh, translocate in the tree, okay? The, set, the, last, the last line is the um, Safari, and... If you, if you spray that tree for basal application, we're not spraying the whole tree, we're doing a basal application um, on that tree, within three hours, you're gonna see um, lanternflies dropping. That's how, that's how fast it is. But the key to it is, you do not wanna use those products on any of the blooming trees, which are the females. It says here, after the bloom. Well, the problem was, Different trees bloom at different times. So I just I just shy away and be extra cautious. I kill the female trees and I use the bay trees um, on the uh, males. Okay, next question. We did, uh, we will share the slideshow. That was an earlier question from Emily and others. There was a question of what brand of strip around the tree you added the foam strip to. And I think that was this. This is the one you recommended, right? Yeah, this is, this is the one you can buy. It. That's about $14.50 on Amazon. Um, they ran out of it last year. Uh, you couldn't find it for a while. Uh, the manufacturer got stuck. and But it's very, very effective. It's very, e very easy to use. Um, and it's a pretty long roll. Um, it, it's probably... I'm guessing 25, 30 feet. So it does an awful lot of trees. Um, and it's it's and it stays sticky. I mean it's 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 and it's and it's tough, it's tough paper. Even when it gets wet, it doesn't rip. 
you, you know, you got to be careful when you're putting it on, especially if you have a, a rough barked tree. But if you do it, as I mentioned, and put the sticky paper down on the inside, it'll really help save some pollinators. Just right here like this. I did hear Jim or Brian that swimming pools were pretty good traps as well. Yeah, I had a customer call me last year and said, I've got all these bugs in my pool and I'm pulling out a five gallon pail every three days. And this was the <laughs> first instar and second star. So I came over to visit, see the guy because I was doing industrial weed control at his lumber company. And right next to his fence, he had about 25 Atlantis trees. I said, well, we get rid of these. You're not going to have any of these. <laughs> but he, but he, he, I mean, he, his pool, his pool filter kept, kept getting clogged and everything. Yeah, what I found is they have to say by experimenting in my pool, um, they actually have to stay underwater for almost two minutes before they die. So completely submerged for two minutes before they, they actually die. Um, was that a scientific test you did there, Jim? It is, with, with my iPhone and uh, holding them underwater. Yes, very, yeah. Uh, this is a question, someone asking, is there a homemade solution that's effective for spotter and lanternfly? You recommended this organic one. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of info on the uh, internet concerning home remedies. Um, but you've got to be careful because some of these, when they when they are adding vinegar and salt and things like this, then you can have some collateral damage because you've got to make sure that it's safe in the garden. Because if you're spraying around your roses or in the back of your patio, whatever the case is, um, you know, it, it's easier to go with one product and say, okay, well, I'm going to spray this product today over here, I'm gonna spray this product over here. It, it's, yeah, I mean, there are some home remedies, just make sure you read the complete information. Because if it's safe on vegetables and in the garden, now this product, if you, and, and the most important thing is read the full label. Now, when you have or, an organic product like this, it's rated by uh, OMRI listed, it is, they've never done the tox studies per se. They've never done long-term feeding studies on this and whatever the case is, just everything in that container is organic. Some of them have done some tox studies and it, it'll say on here, do not spray in a pond. Do not spray where your koi's are. Do not spray in, a, in the water, in, you know, because they can be toxic to uh, amphibians. That's why it's good to spot spray and only spot spray. Brian, I found that uh, Penn State Extension, Cornell, Rutgers, those are reputable sites that will give Absol good advice on a yes, lot of these things. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can go on the Penn State website. You can go on the Cornell website. Um, then you've got the whole Department of Agriculture everybody looking over everybody else's shoulder, making sure all the information is kosher. I mean, because if you get on some of these websites, you, I mean, it looks like, uh, you know, a witch's brew sometimes. Here's a question about uh, the Catchmaster paper. How do you keep the adults from walking over the reverse Catchmaster paper? It seems like it, they could just walk over the outside they can, but if it's off the paper, off the tree, three quarters of an inch or an inch, they will crawl underneath. Now, some may jump over the top, but they will crawl up this tree and go underneath it. And once they get underneath, they're done. Because as soon as they open their wings, or they try to reverse themselves, because the higher they go, the tighter it gets. So you got to have this half inch gap right here with that the twigs yep. are helping. Yep. I mean, in, I mean that stick that's at five o'clock is probably almost an inch in diameter. So you're talking, you know, a good inch. 
and very few of them will climb, it will jump over that. You got to remember that they jump and glide. They, so they will jump and glide to the tree. They won't jump from the bottom of the sticky paper and jump over it. Okay. So this question is, okay, you've treated an Atlantis tree with Pathfinder. How do you recommend controlling spotter and lantern fly? I guess they're asking after the tree has been treated to kill it. When that tree is treated within two to three weeks, it's shutting down and it will not produce, the leaves will die and it will not produce the sap that they want. And say that, so they will go to what we, what we like to say, we'll kill most of the trees and then have the trap tree close by. Now, if you do it very late in the season, yes, then you, then you have an overlap. But it's better than nothing. So you can, you know, if you, do, if you do it late, you can always put the paper on that tree and also kill it. And you'll find out by the end of the season, the paper's not going to be catching anything because there's nothing, they're not crawling on that tree. I have a question for you, Brian. How much are you seeing uh, actual damage that it kills the tree? If I've got, you know, if I've got maples and oaks on my property, should I be worried the spot and lantern fly are going to kill those trees? We haven't, we haven't seen... We'll say this much. The lanternfly weakens the tree. So it's more susceptible to other things. If there's a drought, if there's a fungus, whatever the case is. If you have enough lanternflies on that tree and it's a young tree, it, it could be in trouble. Now, you've got to remember that this is only really like the fourth year and they've expanded and expanded and expanded and spread out. It's really ornamentals. I mean, I, I've seen, I saw a lady in Wayne last year who lost all her roses. I mean, she her rose bushes shut down because the lantern flies were, the, the first and second stages were all over those roses. And she didn't want to spray them. And I respected that. And she's out there trying to pick them and they're jumping all over the place and whatever else. And she lost, all, she, she lost, and these were climbing roses. And I mean, they may bloom again this year, but she lost her whole rose crop last year. This question is about maples. And I will say in our buffers, the, the spot and lantern flies seem to like maples. The ones I've seen are stained black, but they look healthy. Um, at least in the first year. The tree had leaves, it, it, it had a good crown, but boy, the stem was stained black. Now this question is, if I have silver maples, can we use the systemic on maples the same way you do Atlantis? Do you recommend that? Oh yeah, I mean, I, 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 on any of the trees that they are feeding on, I recommend it as a, uh, a bay tree. Now you're not gonna be able so to do- no, no, I'm talking about the insecticide. That's right. Yeah, but I want to confirm it doesn't kill the tree. Oh, no, no. The, 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 the insecticide does not kill the tree at all. Safari is the safari and the uh, merit are both used for emerald ash borer, too. Hmm. The Merit is the number two product in the marketplace besides tree injection itself. But yes, um, bait, I mean, don't hesitate. If you see a whole lot on a, my son had a maples in his yard and we baited every single one of them mm. because they were coming to those trees and they were odd shaped trees, different barks, different limbs and all the rest of it. And it was very difficult to put up the sticky paper. So we just baited the trees. Right. I don't see any new questions coming in. 
This was really great. You gave us a lot of really good information. I like that you uh, are paying attention to the pollinators. That's really important. And there are some organic solutions. Um, I imagine when you do this, you're you're helping your neighbors as much as um, anyone else, right? Because if, uh, Every, if you, your neighbors aren't doing this, you know they're they're moving these bugs. When I started putting up paper on my property two years ago, sticky paper, all my neighbors said, "What's that for?" And I said, "Just wait." And I gave them the information. And last summer, probably, and I live in a neighborhood next to an elementary school. It's probably has 75 houses in it. And I'd say the 50 of the houses have this paper on it last summer. Wow. And every time they saw me, they said, where, where are you getting your paper? You know, Amazon doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. But Jim Jordan, it, do you want to say anything that close us out? I'm sorry, Brian. No, that's okay. But so the key to it is if you reverse it, then there's no chance, very little chance, of bees or butterflies, hummingbirds, small animals, you know, chipmunks, whatever else, getting caught on the on the paper, unless you're going to cage it. And then the problem is when you cage it, then you got to take that cage down to revert to you know change the paper. Yep. Great. Anything you want to say, Jim, to close us out? Yeah, I just would like to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, please know when when BRC entered into this uh, this study with with Brian O'Neill and Weeds Incorporated, uh, you know, we were looking at a quick, easy fix for homeowners, and we experimented with duct tape and Gorilla tape, and it didn't work. We were concerned about about bycatch, and of course, we're always going concerned about herbicide and um, insecticide treatment. And, um, and that's why we incorporated Brian's help to, to make sure that what we're recommending to you is something that's, that's safe, uh, not only for you, but, but safe for the environment. So, and again, a special thanks to, uh, to the Doc Sater Foundation for making this study possible and um, hopefully reducing our lantern fly uh, population a bit. Thanks, everybody. Really glad to have everybody on board. And uh, I don't know, I heard Brian mention stiltgrass. Maybe that'll be the next one we do. <laughs> uh, very good. Thanks so much, Brian. It was terrific. Appreciate all your knowledge and your help. Okay, my pleasure. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Lots of messages coming in saying thank you. Yep, People I see telling that. Us how much they enjoyed it. That's good. Yep. And if anybody has any questions, you know, don't hesitate to give them my email, my phone. I mean it. Okay. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, oh you're still there, huh? Yeah. First class. A little thanks, after Ellen. hours entomology here. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, are you seeing any um, movement of the triclop here? with the, the root system of Ilanthus being so big, are you getting any movement from that product into surrounding tree roots? No, where you have to be careful is on black locusts. If you treat one black locust, they are so grafted. You know, you get a group of black locusts and their roots will cross and that's where you see uptake because you treat the one black locust, all of a sudden the other ones turn yellow, but not with Ilanthus. I have not seen you know, because there's no root, there's, no, there's very, there's none really uh, soil activity. Whereas other products of soil activity, toward on, uh, Mansipic, Iris, all those, there's soil activity. So you've got to watch your rates around oak trees and things like that, Ellen. Yeah, but I have, no, no, not at all. Good deal. Okay. Thanks guys so much, take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Good seeing you, Alan. You too.
Okay, guys. Great. Take care, Brian. Awesome. Thank you. That was great. You're very Thank welcome. You. Oh, hey, Jim, did you, catch, did you catch those deer with sticky paper? I want to know that. I did. <laughs> I did. But, you know, before we go off, Brian, one thing I want to tell you is um, uh, I'm a fly fisherman, and some of my fly fishing buddies told me last year they actually tied spotted lantern flies, which is a difficult fly to tie. Um, right. In the different stages and trout and even largemouth bass. Largemouth bass love the adult flies. Um, Do they? Across the surface and, and trout like them um, will, will feed actively on the, in the earlier life stages. So, Well, I know that all the trout fishermen I know are all excited about this 17-year uh, cicada release coming up because, mm -hmm. they, because the trout and bass love the little guys. Oh. Oh, yeah, they do. I was at a fish hatchery two weeks ago, 